Welcome to The Bookish Hour with your hosts, Sarah E. Burr and J.C. Kenny. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Bookish Hour. I am one of your co-hosts, Sarah Burr, and we are delighted to have you with us this evening. My co-host, J.C. Kenny, is joining me. And Hi, folks. we have got a great show for you. We are we joined do. by the wonderful Lita Sedaris, and Woo. we have um, a great evening planned for you, including a giveaway. So... For yes. um, just some housekeeping items uh, before we dive into things. Um, for those of you that are joining us live, thank you very much for being here. Make sure that you are logged in to the, uh, either to YouTube or your Google account so you can chat with us. We would love to take your questions live. And Lita has a giveaway for us planned, which is super exciting. So you have to stay with us the whole hour though to enter into the giveaway. So um, we will be giving details as things progress. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, my name is Sarah Burr. I write the Trending Topic Mysteries, the Glenmire Wim Mysteries, and the Court of Mystery series. JC, tell our audience about yourself. Hi, folks. I am so thrilled to have you all here. Special shout out to Rose Kerr and Mark Baker, who have already checked in with us in the chat. So just like Sarah said, if you want to uh, uh, throw in a little question or just say hi, we, we love to uh, we love this aspect of our broadcast because it's great to be able to kind of interact with y'all. Like Sarah said, my name is JC Kenny. I write two mysteries. Note the product placement behind me here. Um, I write the uh, the Alley Cobb mysteries, the latest of which is the blue one there, a parting shot. And I also write the Darcy Gone mysteries, which is the other one, which is uh, what I call rock and roll meets murder mysteries. So, so that's a little bit about me. And now I would love to do nothing more than introduce the lady of the hour. You know her, you love her. If you don't yet, after this hour, you will. The wonderful Lita Sedaris. Hi, Lita. Thank you. Hi, Lita. Thank you so much to Sarah and Jim. I'm very glad to be here. And I write the Southern California Mystery Series. My latest just came out, Gambling with Murder. And it stars a 26-year-old lawyer who works for a movie studio, but her day job takes a back seat to what she loves doing best, which is investigating homicides and missing persons. And in book two of my series, Murder Gone Missing, she even investigates a missing homicide. She's the daughter, she's the daughter of a well-known Los Angeles private investigator, and she's learned a few things from him because they cracked a couple of cases together. But uh, she is in my series cracking cases on her own and without any supervision, which gets her into trouble a lot. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I just there's lots of action because, you know, L.A. stands for lots of action besides San Diego, Los Angeles. So I think my series has uh, a lot of action and it's also has a little bit of humor in it as well. It's a lot of fun for me to write. I when ahead, I like ladies first. <laughs> well, when I when I like looked into your series, Lita, and started reading, I was like, I love nothing more than like Hollywood celebrity, like all of the craziness. And so the fact that you have like an entertainment lawyer in the mix, I think, is so fun. Um, how did how did the character of Corey like come about? Because like it just seems like a very um, like the uh, entertainment law just seems like a, a very fascinating topic to dive into. Thank you. Well, way back in the day, I was somewhat like Corey. This is very loosely based on my former life oh, when wow. I worked in a movie studio. That's really cool. I was so fortunate out of law school to get a job in a studio. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, it was not nearly as exciting as what she does, but I learned a lot. 
And fast forward a few decades, um, and I decided I want to write a mystery, and I didn't know what to write about. So what do we authors do? We write what we know. Mm -hmm. So I used myself as the blueprint, and I wrote a book, I wrote a draft, and I kept nodding off during the draft. It was so boring. So then I went back, as you know, we do many rewrites. And this one, I, my first book actually, Murder and Other Unnatural Disasters, I rewrote probably about a hundred times to oh, get wow. it to the way I wanted. So, because again, my life was pretty dull as an entertainment attorney. You don't, it sounds more exciting than it is. <laughs> I made sure my heroines was not nearly as dull. She has a lot of other things going on, but I did throw a few things, a few tidbits in there that actually happened to me in real life. And it felt really good because it helped me get things off my chest that I didn't realize had been sitting there for quite some time. <laughs> so that's how I came up with it. You know, that's 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 so interesting, because I think so many of us, when we think about, you know, we get that bug to write and we want to write a story. And you're right. You know, we think that, um, OK, I'm going to write what I know. But I think um, a lot of us have that same thought that, oh, but what I do is so boring. So how am I going to figure that out? So um, I guess, can you talk a little bit about, you know, despite the fact that you consider your job boring, how did you take then what you know from your experience as an entertainment lawyer and kind of uh, put a twist on it to, you know, make it work for you in the storytelling? Well, I know what they do. I know what a, a lawyer in the studio does. They, we basically just negotiate and draft contracts. So that's no fun to read about. I do have her trying to negotiate and draft contacts, but she's constantly getting interrupted because she is the daughter of a well-known private investigator who had a reputation around town. So anytime anything happens, people would go to her with, with anything. I mean, I think there are two subplots in there too. In the, my first book, one is a, a missing cat that belonged, oh, I'm sorry, just gave it away, but it was missing lucky charm that belonged to a well-known uh, basketball player. And I happened to meet a professional basketball player. So that's how he got thrown into the story. And the second subplot is a well-known, I think it's a rapper actually. And he also has an issue. So I just took those and, and ran with them as fast as I could <laughs> to make things happen, to make it interesting for me. Because as you know, it has to be interesting to us before you know we can get it quite the way we want it on paper. And so our readers will enjoy it as well. So actually, not all of my books, the, this is number five that just came out, deal with the entertainment industry. Some of them just touch upon it, like number one and number three, actually, really, she gets into the, the studio life there. But in the others, she leaves it because she has to solve the crimes elsewhere. So that makes it more interesting to me as well. As much as the first one was kind of a blueprint, the rest are not at all. So I completely got away from myself, which was a, even more fun in number two through five and so forth. I have two more in this series coming up. How did you decide, Lita, that you wanted to write a mystery? Was was the mystery presented to you first and foremost? Was your character was your character introduced to you? Or, or I'm always curious, like what what made you write mystery? Why well, mysteries, right? Um, it's the book. It's the type of book, I, the genre I like to read the most mm -hmm. because I'm always so intrigued about red herrings and the twists and turns. I mean, how do you, how do they do that? I always want to know from reading my first Nancy Drew, I don't know if you can see in my background, but I've got some originals back there as well. Nice. Yeah, I love those. But from reading those, I was, I remember my eight year old self being so fascinated about uh, a young woman who was so accomplished and so smart, so intelligent, so daring, so brave. I mean, she had my full attention. I didn't pay attention to her to her, the convertible she was driving or the way she looked, but it was what she did. She was a woman of action. She took control of situations and I never forgot that. So when it came time for me wanting to write a, a mystery, because again, my favorite type of book, I tried to create a, a heroine who was kind of the same, a woman of action. She has skills that I don't have, but I would love to have. She's got a whole uh, collection of weaponry that she inherited from her father, legal and illegal, and she knows how to use it. Her favorite is a Japanese throwing star, a shuriken, because it's a weapon of distraction, not destruction. Anyway, so I just really ran with it and did things that, again, I would never do, but I would love to do. If I could be on the page and no one would get hurt and there'd be a happy ending. That's my type of book. Mm -hmm. Well, I tell you what, I just want to uh, let you know, you, you uh, 
Uh, Corey is certainly does certainly have her fans. Oh, I can tell you, Mad Torque, one of our viewers, uh, chimed in and said, Corey is my favorite. So oh, there you go. So yeah, that's always yeah. nice to nice to uh, to hear. So I guess can you talk about you know again is is I'm already totally reeled in here by the way. Um, you know it sounds so cool. Um, talk to us a little bit more about uh, some of this weaponry, especially maybe you know maybe other things like the shurikens and some of the other uh, what I guess we would consider maybe unusual things, and maybe also when she's had to use those. Well, in California, everything's illegal. So you can't use any of those things. But she, okay. again, she's inherited it. So she does have it on her person. Her father fashioned a belt for her with a special five-pointed star buckle. And that's where she keeps her shuriken, her Japanese throwing star. So it's always at her disposal. She's never without that belt. And she always, it's like in her hand all the time. And she'll use it. She's, she's never hurt anybody. And even though she's gone target practicing with her father and she knows how to use uh, pistol of which she has many hidden all over. She's never actually shot anyone. And she does mention that. Uh, she has used, she has brass knuckles. She's never used those either, but she's got a lot of things. I mean, some of them, I don't even know yet. I'll have to wait and find out what else she's got <laughs> uh, up her sleeves. But she even, she has sidekicks who are very important. They're highly motivated sidekicks, but they're very important to her. And because of her, they have their own types of weapons that they feel comfortable with. For example, Michael, her best friend and now love interest, has a tranquilizer gun because he's too afraid of hurting another person or himself. So he won't carry anything but that. He also carries a little knife that she gifted him with. And her other sidekicks have different uh, things as well, from pepper spray, uh, disguised as lipstick, to i'm sure there are other things i can't remember at the moment but they have all sorts of things because again they're highly motivated and they'll do whatever they can to take the bad guy down or bad girl bad whoever <laughs> that person down <laughs> i think it's so, really really clever that you have your your supporting characters they are also characterized by you know the type of weapon that they're carrying i think that that level of detail is really um, is really clever. Um, what, 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 uh, or how would you describe Corey's like group of friends or those that are her loved ones that are around her? Are they mostly supportive of the work that she's doing? Are they kind of like, Hey, you're risking your life too much. You know, maybe you should stop. How, how do her friends and family help with her or hinder their investigations? Well, thank you. It's been an evolution because in the first book, Corey herself wanted to back off and not do it because something has happened to her father that she didn't want to happen to herself. Mm -hmm. so she was ambivalent about continue, continuing this, the PI work. She, her plan was just to settle in as a lawyer quietly in the entertainment industry and just do her practice and nothing else. But it didn't work that way. Maybe the law of attraction, again, she thrives on doing this kind of thing. So, and her mother was dead set against it as well. And she has been until my most recent book, things turn around completely. Uh, as Again, as the book evolved, the various sidekicks, there are three of them. Uh, Michael, the one with the trank gun, is a tech whiz, a culinary whiz, and they've been best friends forever. And so it fits his personality as someone who's sincere, has integrity, is a gentle person to have a trank gun because he doesn't have to worry about causing great harm. Uh, Vera, uh, the uh, she's a former security guard, her legal, it's Corey's legal assistant and now uh, associate PI. She wants them to stop being lawyers or working in the legal industry, and she wants to start their own PI firm. So that's that's a direction it's going in. And Corey's discovering that, you know what, maybe she wants to do that, too. And then there's the mother, and she's dead set against Corey doing anything because, again, of what happened to her uh, ex-husband, Corey's father. But that kind of changes in my latest book because she uh, is drawn into what Corey's de doing. They need her. Corey thinks we'll just bring her in, use her for what we need, and that is to get into a posh retirement community in Santa Barbara, California, <laughs> and then we'll get rid of her. But the mother doesn't go, and she actually stays, and she has uh, skills that Corey find quite surprising. Mm -hmm. well, you think you know a person, right? <laughs> Even as, as her mother. So things turn around there, too. I like it, I'm sure, as, as you both do. It's nice to see your sleuth and the sidekicks, the characters change, progress. And mm -hmm. because I, I know myself, when, a, when they stay the same in this series, it kind of gets a little tedious. So 
anyway, I try to make sure that that happens, that they progress in a positive fashion throughout the series. So kind of one of the things that strikes me is um, you talking about Corey kind of being kind of official, maybe unofficial, private investigator. Um, we're often um, asked for, when folks aren't familiar with our books or our story, um, who, do we, who would we compare our books to? which to me, it's like, well, no, my book is the greatest thing ever and it's the most unique thing ever. It can't be done. Um, but in all seriousness, you know, I find myself, for example, comparing my books to so-and-so. And I'm sure if somebody asked for comps, Sarah would say the same. It sounds to me, and tell me if I'm wrong, but it sounds to me like there's a certain um, Janet Ivanovich, Kinsey Milhone mashup you've got going there between Stephanie Plum and Kinsey. Is that fair, would you say? Or or can you talk about maybe if you have any other, maybe not not just Nancy or Drew, but maybe some more contemporary authors that you, you feel have kind of influenced your writing? Well, I think you win the prize, JC, because I mean, <laughs> Janet Ivanovich is one of my favorite authors. Uh, I haven't read her latest books, but I've read the series probably through 14 or 15. I have some here I have to catch up to, but it's, you know, she, she writes so simply, which is so challenging to do. So I really love her writing style. I would love to be able to write like that. If someone can, compares my books to hers, I am beyond flattered because I don't know how to write. She's very talented. I don't know how to write on that. It's, I'm a work in progress. I'm trying, but I like her characters. I like that it's so light. I like that I can read those on a plane and completely be sucked in and forget about everything else around me. That's what I try to do, but she does it so effectively. It's just, I, I mean, really, if I had a, a writer that I would love to meet and hang out with for just a short time, it would be her because she, she's just, I think, the top in humorous mysteries. Uh, Kinsey Milhone, of course, those are fantastic books too, uh, especially because they're set in Santa Barbara. So even fictional Santa Barbara, but it's fun for locals to say, is this Paseo Nuevo Mall or is she using this, you know? We have to try to figure out what she's using as a backdrop and that's a lot of fun too. She's mm -hmm. also a strong heroine and she can, you know, she's a professional, but she knows how to use her weapons. All of that is a lot of fun. And yes, you're right on the money. That's who I would, um, that's who I like a lot. As well as Alexander McCall Smith though, I really okay. like the number one ladies detective agency because there's always a little bit of wisdom thrown around through those, very gentle wisdom. And so I try to slip those in. I don't know if anybody sees them but me, but, but I, I enjoy doing that. And I got that, uh, I guess, idea from reading those books to try to throw in something that makes me think or makes the reader think. For example, in book number four, Slightly Murderous Intent, I have one of Corey's sidekicks say that she won't, Vera, she won't deal with this person because he always yanks her chain. So Corey says to her, you shouldn't be wearing a chain. So that was my little nugget of wisdom that I threw in there that I got from Alexander. Nice. <laughs> Very cool. Now, Lita, you are, uh, Gambling with Mur or for Murder is book five, correct? Uh-huh. Um, and you said you have two more books in the series? Yes. So with that being said, are you beginning to like think about like, how, you know, when you're brainstorming and working on, you know, book six, are you beginning to, um, you know, draw conclusions and, and your characters are moving in the direction that you want them to be moving in? Or are you still like feeling that, you know, there's, there's more to be explored or, or how are you, I guess, how are you dealing with the approaching end of your series? Well, that's a great question. And as maybe you both know, too, I, I can't control my characters mm -hmm. because I they start one way and then all of a sudden they go in a completely different direction. For, yeah, example, that. Yeah. <laughs> For example, even in my latest, Gambling with Murder, I didn't, when I started writing this, I didn't set it in Santa Barbara. It was set somewhere else in Southern California. Okay. Maybe for the first four or five chapters. Then I started thinking, you know, I'm getting bored with this. I don't like the setting. And I didn't want to use Santa Barbara because it's too close to home. And I don't like doing things that are too close to me in the books. But I said, let me just try it. It's not going to work, but I tried it anyway. And it just, it was kind of seamless because there happens to be, I'm going off on a tangent, Sarah, I hope you don't no, mind. Of course, no, no. There happens to be a luxury resort in Santa Barbara and Montecito specifically. It's a 
Four Seasons Biltmore, but it's been sh it's been closed during the pandemic. And so walking by there, I was thinking, you know, what are they going to do with this place? It is gorgeous. It looks like a Hawaiian resort across from the ocean, palm trees, be lush, beautiful gardens. I mean, everything you'd want in a resort. And I thought, well, this would be great for a retirement community, a very upscale retirement community. And that's where it started. And that's where I moved it um, to Santa Barbara. Also, during the pandemic, there are a lot of older people in my life, uh, parents, parents-in-law. And so spending a lot of time with them made me think retirement community too. I didn't want to write that at first either because that was a little bit disturbing at times and I had to write it light. But ultimately, it became quite light, I think. And it was fun because I don't know if you have any senior citizens in your lives, but um, they may look frail, but they may not necessarily be as frail as one might think. <laughs> mm -hmm. They can be pretty sharp and mm -hmm. they want to do things. They don't want to just sit back and watch soap operas or whatever all day. They want to, they want some action in their lives. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of like a little nod to, to those seniors who have a lot of energy and, you know, life in them that they want to use and they want to use it the way they want to use it. So that was also a lot of fun for me. Nice. Back to my series. I'm not quite sure what they're going to do, Sarah. I, I, number six is, um, I think I'm about maybe five or six chapters in. Mm -hmm. It continued to surprise me. Like who? Someone showed up in chapter two, and I ended up taking him out because I felt like he didn't belong there. Okay. So anyway, I just don't know right now. But I have a sense of how it's going to end. We'll see if it actually happens that way. That makes me feel a lot better because I'm in the process of uh, wrapping up my Court of Mystery series, and I have two. No. I'm, I'm, it's going to end at 10 books, which I feel like is okay. enough books to have in a series, but I'm like, can I, can I like wrap everything up? Can I do everything that I want to do before, like, you know, we reach the end. And so I'm always just curious, like, how do you, how do you end a, how do you like wrap things up or, or, or do you wrap things up? Do you leave the door open for more adventures and and all of that good stuff? I don't know, JC, if you wanted to talk about, I mean, I would love to hear about the process that you went through for um, writing A Parting Shot, which has got to be one of the best finales of a cozy that I've ever read. Like, just a shout out to that. It was so good, it was so moving. Um, I think, like, readers absolutely love it. Uh, I would just, I would love to hear more about like that process. Well, first off, Sarah, thank you very much. That's too kind. And I appreciate all the support you've given me and Allie and everybody else in the Russian Creek uh, mystery books. Um, yeah, for me, it was um, a couple of factors kind of came together at once. It was really uh, the business of writing and the business of publishing uh, kind of coming to loggerheads with the creative process. And what I mean by that is that the reality of it was I had a few more ideas I could have written for Allie, but um, I was struggling creatively with figuring out, okay, you know, I realize in cozy and traditional mysteries, as fans, we, we go along with the fact that somebody moves to town or something happens and all of a sudden we have this spate of murders and you know that that's part of that's part of the deal that's part of the agreement we have um but i found myself after a while thinking you know this town of russian creek indiana it's only got three thousand people you know um and i felt like i was beginning to struggle to find ideas that i liked so that kind of ended up intersecting in with the fact of the reality of the publishing business that um, I'm very fortunate to have a lot of wonderful fans who really love Allie, but um, there unfortunately aren't enough of them to continue the series. So that's just the business world. So um, I knew that at, as I was writing book five in this series, I had a growing sense that book six was just going to have to be the end. Um, and the reason I decided that is because I thought it would be an opportunity to let Allie go out on her terms. And um, what, I, what I told Sarah, we've talked about this a, little, a few times informally, I'm a big fan of Star Trek. And one of the things that I was, have always been so thrilled about is I thought the final episode of the Next Generation series all the way back to 94. Um, really, I just loved that story so much. Whether you're a fan of Star Trek or not, um, 
just the fact that they were able to use this idea that, you know, okay, the series is coming to an end. We're going to give all of these characters a proper positive send off and also do it in such a way that it kind of brings back some of the main characters throughout the length of the, the story. Uh, or the the series, so that's what I kind of that's the idea I came up with for Ally. And that okay, is there a way that I can kind of make this a almost a fan service book? How many characters can I bring in that have been through all the other five previous books? I had a love interest that's kind of worked the way through. You know, do I want to let them kind of have Ally and her boyfriend Brent? Do I want to have them have a final happily ever after? And so going into the process, knowing it was going to be the final book, I was able to kind of have that mindset that this is it. And so um, it, it worked out for me. I, mm -hmm. I think I ended up being uh, very fortunate that I was happy. The story just kind of keeping in mind that it was the last one that I wanted to to have people from all the way back in the first book show up again. That ended up working well with the plot. And um, it was a lot of fun. It was, it was kind of scary, you know, and there were a lot of mixed emotions there too. But again, I also felt that it was an opportunity, like I said, to let the characters go out on top. Because one of the things I feel so bad for authors is that when they are writing a series and then their publishers to their publishers make the decision not to to continue that series. And so a writer is left kind of saying, OK, what do I do now? And so I was able to make that decision. So that's a really long winded way of, you know, kind of two things came together and I was able to make that choice up front. I, but Jason, not me. Did, you, did you leave the door open at all? I did. I did. Um, and, and I thought that I decided that, um, because like our lives, you know, we never know what's going to happen next. And so we should, to the best we can, never say never. So yes, I did, um, kind of, well, not kind of, I did leave the door open. I don't want to say any more than that. Um, so, you know, we'll see. And, and that is one of the op opportunities, again, having the ability to do that. You know, I can maybe come back in a few years, write a new series, have a spinoff series, whatever. So, yeah. I think your point about the um, having a small town that just like has this influx of crime all of the sudden is that's such a like a, a point that I really had never thought about because um, because we just go along with it. We're just like, oh, like, you know, we're writing cozy mysteries. We're just we're just here for the murder. Uh, but, you know, the fact that these are like 3000 population towns, you know, Yes, that is very suspicious. But Lita, your setting is not in a three thousand person town. So I'm curious with um, where where JC was mentioning, like he was able to bring back like a lot of characters that readers had met during the entire series. Do you um, in in while writing your books, does Corey frequently have contact with repeated people outside of her small circle, or is she kind of um, you know, does she find herself amongst new faces every time uh, that that she has a an adventure? Besides her sidekicks and her boss, her bosses at the studio, mm -hmm. always it has, it's been so far, I should say, new faces. But I have been asked by readers, are you going to bring back this person? Because he seemed like he liked Vera. and Maybe they should become boyfriend and girlfriend. Okay. Or mm -hmm. is this going to happen? And I have thought about that. But for example, in this, in my new book, Gambling with Murder, uh, it just didn't work. And maybe, like JC said, towards the end, they might show up again. But unless they truly belong there and I can work them in, it, it's not going to happen. But mine is also called a cozy mystery by many people. So maybe it's an updated cozy because Southern California is not a small town. <laughs> and I do have the luxury of moving because Southern California has a lot of little towns, big towns, all sorts of places. And in my upcoming, the one that I'm writing currently... I have Corey in a place in Southern California, population 3,800. So it's okay. like a small town, but it's only 20 minutes away from Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's a buffered on one side by Malibu and the other side by another large uh, town. So I have a lot of choices. I mean, I didn't plan that. I didn't know I was going to write a series. My first book was just a, my first book. But then it, it seemed to turn out that I, I could do it. And that's what happened. How yeah. did you know that? It, that you had more to, to say? I felt like there was potential with the characters in the first one because she had no sidekicks. She didn't want anyone. She wanted to do everything on her own mm -hmm. in the first book because she she's the one who could do it. 
she had friends, but she was she kind of pushed away Vera, who at the time worked across the street as a security guard. Vera wanted to be her friend because she wanted to move out of that industry that she was in to the movie studio. But Corey didn't want her. Fast forward to book number five and they're fast friends. And she's, you know, helps her. She does a lot of they do a lot of stuff together, a lot of important stuff. So once I realized that there were people who could potentially come back for other books uh, besides Vera, again, her best friend, and there's an assistant DA who appears in the first four books, too. I thought that there was something there that more could be said. And plus the studio, there's so much that goes on there, so many different personalities. But actually, that's the part that I like to write about the least because the personalities are not necessarily the most pleasant mm -hmm. in the studio. And I prefer to have them more pleasant if I if I if that's possible. We'll let the villains be the not so great ones. But anyway, so I've moved away from the studio and that's another evolution that Corey's moving along with me. And she wants to move away from her day job and start her own PI agency. You know, in starting a business, that that uh, brings up a, a question that I think is really interesting. Um, Sarah was on a panel back at the Malice Domestic fan convention back last month that talked about technology and cozy mysteries and technology and mysteries. Um, and, and I just thought it was really interesting about how, especially with Sarah's main character, Coco Klein, in a hashtag follow me for murder book, um, that uh, Coco is a blogger. So for her, technology and being on the net is is literally a way of life. Um, you know, for some of my characters, they're more of like, okay, they use it like we normally do, you know, as an average run of the mill person. Um, how do you feel that, uh, where do you think Corey falls on that, um, that, uh, that spectrum? Because I think a lot of us, for those of you who don't know, I live in Indianapolis. And so living in the Midwest, we tend to think of folks who live in Southern California, LA, as kind of a real go-go type atmosphere. Everybody's got their phone on, everybody's busy, um, things like that. So kind of, can you talk about how technology fits in with you know your writing and how it serves the storytelling well in my writing i mean everything's on the laptop for me i can't do anything in longhand i do take notes now and then and when i do summarize my chapters after i don't do the first draft i do it um in longhand but as far as technology and corey and her and, and the series uh, Corey doesn't have technological skills, but remember, she has sidekicks, and the sidekicks fill in the gaps for the things that she doesn't have. So Michael, her BFF, is a tech, um, he's a computer science professor, or dean actually, co-dean, at uh, a college in Southern California that's suspiciously similar to Caltech, except he's, <laughs> this is called LA Tech. So, I mean, that's, you'd have to read my latest, again, Gambling with Murder, but his tech skills come in extremely handy when she has to get into this uh, this uh, exclusive retirement community. He's the one who really plays a huge role in getting them in there by using technology. And he does that in all the books because he, he knows that stuff. I mean, he doesn't like to use the H word, the, the hacking, but I mean, he can do that. And I am so fortunate because my older son is a computer science whiz. So if I have any questions, if I need anything, can I do this or how do you do this? Oh, I've, I've learned so much thanks to him. Even I think it's, um, I forget which book now, but I think it's Slightly Murderous Intent, book number four, where she has a special camera inside of her house pointed at her front door. So she, her whole house is booby trapped because you never know when someone might break in. It's Los Angeles after all. So, but I, I did that with some help from my son because I don't know the first thing about technology, but it's like a crash course. So I know it, it's just so nice in real life to have sidekicks too, don't you think? Who can fill in your gaps? So <laughs> sure. in, that, in that sense, I'm like Corey, because I have my own sidekicks who will help me with things that I don't know. Michael's also a culinary whiz and she can't cook. That comes in very handy. Otherwise she'd probably never eat. <laughs> I love that. And and I just do want to uh, also uh, let you know that uh, Mark Baker, Mark, God love you. Mark commented that uh, uh, if it makes us feel any better, we, the SoCal residents here, think of people in the Midwest as taking things much slower than we do. And Mark thinks he's jealous. And it's like, well, Mark, I tell you, I've often said there are people who, especially um, in the music industry, who can sing faster than I can think. 
especially rappers and hip hop artists. So yes, we do tend to take things a little slower here in the Midwest. But uh, um, so I guess kind of then along that line, one other question that I have, Lita, is that um, to your point about sidekicks, one of the th other challenges I think is um, how do you deal with writing somebody, like I'm 56, and my characters are usually, my main characters are in their mid thirties. So, I mean, that, that's a whole other generation. Um, you know, uh, how do you approach writing folks who maybe have different backgrounds or different ages? Because I know I'm constantly going to my two kids and saying, how would somebody who is a lot younger than me say something, for yes. example? That's what I do with my two kids because they are the same age or around the same age as my uh, protagonist. Like, do, do you, I listen to how they speak. I watch TV shows to listen to how they speak. I have an assistant who, or all of my assistants have been around that same age. I listen to them constantly and I take notes. I take lots of notes. So that's very helpful. Um, in this, and again, in my newest book, Gambling with Murder, I actually have someone who's closer to my age, Corey's mother. And a lot of people have mentioned, a lot of readers have mentioned that that's their favorite character, that she's a scene stealer. And I, I was trying to think about why that is, but it could be because I'm re I can relate to her and her age. So I know how she talks. I know how she might think about her kids, her, her daughter and so on. So maybe she was easier for me to write. I don't know if that's necessarily the case, or at least it was fun to write that one because they're all so young. They're all between the ages of... Uh, I'd say 26 and 32 for the most part, except for the secondary characters. And all of a sudden she's in a retirement community. Her mother's there. Again, she's in her, I think she's 55. And so that was, that was actually drawing on personal experience to, to mm -hmm. write that one. And that, that made it easy. Maybe my next protagonist in another series will have to be a different age. That's really interesting that readers like picked up on that connection. Yeah, that was surprising. Um, I didn't, I didn't expect that, but I'm glad that they did because I wasn't sure, like I said in the beginning, if I keep the mother in or take her out, but she did actually steal scenes for, for me as well. So I kept her in because, I mean, I don't know. I, I feel like my, my mother's constantly surprising me with her skills and things that she does. So aren't we constantly surprised by our parents? I know my kids are surprised at me when I tell them I'm the <laughs> tech person at, our, at a meeting. They're saying, what? They double take, you know, you're doing it. So it seems like it's realistic and I guess a lot of people can relate to that. Oh, for, I, I, I definitely think that when, especially like writing scenes with, um, you know, my main character, when she's interacting with her parents, um, it's always very comforting because it's like, this is, you know, sitting around the kitchen table is something I know very, very well. And so I feel in those moments that I'm able to really like capture the essence of, you know, of, of that family bond. Whereas, you know, I've never confronted a murderer face to face before. So sometimes it's like, okay, like, how do I make this as realistic as possible? And you spend a lot of time like figuring out like, how would somebody react in this situation? Whereas those moments that, you know, we grew up with there, uh, they just like flow from you. Yeah, it made things a lot simpler for me. And it made me realize a few things. For example, I don't know if my, Corey's surprised when her mother can play poker. She thinks her mother's just kind of, you know, uh, faking it, but she, uh, she actually can play poker. And I think my kids would be surprised to learn that I can play poker too. So maybe that's where I got that idea from. I wanted her to do things, you know, you want your characters to constantly surprise the reader. You know, you don't want them to be like one dimensional doing the same thing all the time. Mm -hmm. And so again, that's part of the growth of the character and the progression as well. And it helps us to learn new things too about them. And, you know, as, as you both probably do research for your, your mysteries, right? I know I do a lot of excess research. Sometimes I say that we do like an hour's research to write two sentences. But, mm -hmm. but I mean, I've, I've learned a lot about gambling from this book that I didn't know. I've learned a lot about senior citizens who gamble that I did not know and how prevalent it is among a certain age group. I think Somewhere I read that sixty percent of seniors gamble. Oh wow! I mean, it was a normal amount. So again, maybe that was what's what makes this relatable as well. Well, you're drawing things from, like you said, from your life. Yeah. And and I I think that's one of the things that, um, at least for me, that when 
um, you can see, really see on the page when um, there's just a, I think there's something special when you are reading and you, whether it's a fantasy or a mystery or whatever kind of book where you can, you just get the sense that the author is, is touching on something that is personal to them. Well, don't, don't you think um, a lot of our books, no matter what genre, is about relationships? Yeah. And that's important because that's something that people can find relatable. And interestingly enough, I wrote something again in my latest book about Corey's relationship with Vera. I didn't realize at the time, but she's Corey's usually takes the lead because she knows what she's doing. She's the one with the skills, but she suddenly hears a hint of longing in Vera's voice that she wants to do something. And so Corey steps back and lets her do it. And I realize I need to listen more to the younger people who work with me. They, they might want to do some things that I usually do so that they can have that satisfaction too. So I learned something from my character. And just the other day, I let someone I work with take the lead on something. So I thought, you know, Corey just did that. So I certainly can do it too. <laughs> and it made the other person very happy. So, I mean, we, we're constantly learning from our, our books, even though they're fictional characters. They're really, I know mine teach me all the time how to behave, how not to behave, what works, what doesn't work. And so maybe again, the readers will pick on that, pick up on that as well and hopefully feel they're come off in a better place having finished our books. Yeah, I think that that is really, that's, that's, uh, that's some really good stuff you just shared there, there. Um, and, and actually what I'd love to do kind of Sarah, to have you then kind of talk about the fact that again, in your hashtag, follow me for murder. Yeah. Coco is our main character, but she relies on, she's got a really close knit team she does. where she, and so could you kind of, kind of hand in hand there with Lita, talk a little bit about that from, from your perspective. I think that it, well, especially like Coco's group of friends is me living vicariously in her situation of if I was ever put into this situation where I have to solve a murder, there'd be no way that I would want to do it alone. Like I would need my people around me just for like number one to keep me sane and like not going off and doing crazy things. Um, but I just like, I, I have always craved that, the you know, in, in Lita, you've talked about Nancy Drew. Nancy Drew was like my idol. Like she still is. Like I want to be her when I grow up. And <laughs> Nancy, Bess and George are like ever like friend goals for me. I like, I could not get enough of like, wow, these girls are in it together. And so my, uh, my I hate to call them sidekicks because it's like, they're just, there's so much more, like they are Coco's team and like they're in it together. Jasper, Charlotte and Hudson, it's like, they are my ode to Bess and George who are just like always there for Nancy and they're gonna go through whatever they have to, to help her and to keep her safe. And I think that we have to walk a fine line a lot of the times of, you know, you have your, your main character who's like, I need to, to solve this case. But then you have voices of reason around them that are like, do you need to solve this? Why are you putting yourself in harm's way? We want you to be safe. And you, and you have to really be delicate about, you know, people who come across as like, I want you to be safe. And I'm saying, no, you can't do this in a controlling way. Whereas that's not how they, that's not how you want them to be portrayed. You want them to be, I'm concerned about you. I really don't want you doing this because I'm worried, but because you are dead set on doing this, I'm going to help you however I can. And to make sure that you get across the finish line safely. So I think that like that, those relationships are just like the core of you know, yes, the mystery is, you know, front and center, but I think without those relationships to get at least Coco across the finish line, like she never, she never would have made it. Well, I know I used a tagline for my series that was friendship. Friendship is the best weapon when it comes to solving a crime. Ooh, that's a good one. Because that's yeah. what they do. I mean, she couldn't do it without them. Mm -hmm. And they, the most important thing for me, I, I know they're not, they're, there are more than just sidekicks. I completely agree with that. They're not just someone on the side, right? They're sometimes front and center, but they show up. They're loyal. They're there. They know what to do. You know, they're, they're working your back all, all the time, just like people, real people in our life who do that as well. 
So we get to give them to our fictional characters because they need that. I'd want a team too, Sarah, to you know help me when I try to crack <laughs> when the day comes for me to do that. <laughs> I would love a team to help me write a book. Like that, like how awesome would that be? It's like you go write this, let's go, you go write yes. that, you research that. Like, man, that would be that would be the dream. <laughs> You know, so I don't want to interrupt, but I'm going to here because I do believe we're a little bit, uh, we've only got about 15 minutes yes. left. We should make the uh, giveaway announcement. We should. We Lita, should. you want to kind of fill us in on what you're being so kind and giving away tonight? Well, uh, a copy of my latest, it was just released, Gambling with Murder. It's number five, but it can be read as a standalone. Uh, in this, uh, I think I pretty much explained it, but in th this is installment, Corey has to get into an exclusive retirement community because there is a missing senior. No one seems to be worried about this missing senior. He's been gone about four days, except for the assistant director, because she saw some suspicious activity before he went missing. And he left without his driver's license, his credit cards, and his AAA card. I mean, that was all very worrisome. So she's, she's hired kind of um, undercover, to see if she can figure out, is he in trouble? Is he just off on a little jaunt on his own or, or what's the story? So anyway, yes, either a print version or an e-version of my latest book, Gambling with Murder. All right, and so to enter, what we would ask our wonderful viewers who are joining us live right now, um, please in the chat, so make sure that you're logged into your Google account, your YouTube account, whatever, so that you can use the chat feature. Um, please enter the special word casino. That's what we decided, right guys? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. I was like. There is um, a casino on the cover of my book. I don't know if you can see it, but. There, that was brilliant. It's a beautiful. Jason. It's such a fun cover. Oh my god. That is a great cover. Yeah, yeah. So we are going. The it's the giveaway is open now. Please enter the word casino into the chat. We will be pulling a winner at the end of the hour. Um, so you guys have some time to enter um, as we continue our discussion. Um, Lita, I, my question for you: We had kind of touched on it um, in regards to the research that that we're doing what was the most interesting fact that you discovered while you were researching this book wow besides are... that 60 percent of seniors gamble uh well let's see i mean there's just there's so much i learned about the background of the setting this this ho hotel and how it came to be and what it was before it was someone's house i believe a, a luxury mansion and I think they might have fallen through to hard times and they had to, to change it. Um, let's see, what else did I learn? Just what's, what they do at lavish retirement communities. I mean, their buffets are not just standard buffets. They're extraordinary buffets. Oh, also I learned, this was very interesting. I, I did read about uh, seniors who maybe some would refer to as geriatric delinquents because they're constantly getting into trouble. Some of these seniors, when they play games that normal seniors play, they're not normal games. For example, instead of playing croquet, they play combat croquet, which is a different version. I know I never heard of that before, but it's very popular. I think it's even popular, and I forget if it was Australia or New Zealand. It, it's a big deal back then. Um, and they make up their own rules as they go along. Sometimes they don't even use the mallets. They use makeshift mallets that they create with like CVC pipes or whatever. I don't know. I found that fascinating because I never heard about that before. There is a, a, such a thing as combat croquet. Now, is uh, the combat because like they're hitting each other with things or? Well, you know, that can happen. There, wow. there are no rules. So, I mean, <laughs> I've never read about anyone getting hurt in mm -hmm. combat croquet. But I mean, instead of going for the hoop that it goes through, they might hit a person's foot. Or they might try to hit wildlife. They always miss, though. That that never works because the wildlife are quick. But anyway, so yeah, combat croquet was something that I I found quite intriguing, and so I, of course I had to throw that in there as well. I'm gonna have to look that up. That sounds like what, a really yeah. fun summer uh, game. What's the saying? What happens in combat croquet yes. stays in combat croquet. That's why, that's why I can't say too much about it. But but yes. <laughs> Because Corey didn't know about it either. And so she thought they all had to dress in white, like, you know, formal croquet. It's a very sedate game. She was just kind of hovering in the background. Then she, as she watches, she's thinking, what is going on here? What are they doing? And then Vera, who was there too, 
said that her grandmother, who lives who lived in a retirement uh, place, was very well aware of combat croquet and played it herself. So I guess in this, maybe if you're a certain age, you might have heard of combat croquet and might have even engaged in it. Oh, wow. Although I did read in the U.S. that younger people are doing it too now. Now, what would be the... Aren't you glad you asked that question, Sarah? Oh, yeah. Well, no, I mean, I'm, I'm literally going to be like, guys, we're going to be playing combat croquet this summer <laughs> because that just like ups the stakes. Um, Lita, what would be, what's like the, I guess, the most random play, I guess maybe, let's do this a, a website that you found yourself on while researching your, any of your books. Oh my, there are so many random websites that I go on and I'm afraid I spend way too much time on them because they're interesting, but I may never use them on my, in any of my books, but gee, I'm not sure. I mean, I did, I was actually, I was looking for recipes for gourmet rice crispy treats Ooh. because that's something that this uh, hotel, this retirement community serves. So I was looking at all the different types that there were. So that was pretty random because I haven't had a rice crispy treat since I was probably a teenager. And I didn't even know that they still made Rice Krispies, but Let they, they gourmet did. ones. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that was that was. I think that was pretty random. JC, what about you? What would what would you think is like the most random website you've been on? Oh wow! You know, actually today I was um, on a. I, I spent a lot of time on medical websites, and um, the one I spent on today. I was looking up the condition porphyria and not to give away too much, but this is for a new uh, project that I'm working on where a character um, is colloquially, collo easily, okay, commonly known as the vampire. And so we come to find out, well, you know, it turns out that, well, this is an individual with a, a diagnosed condition called porphyria. So there are actually some people in the world who look like vampire may look like vampires but because of this uh condition they have they have to stay out of the sun there is no cure for this uh genetic condition so that's kind of my bizarre little research rabbit hole today how about you sarah i would say that the most random one that i have been on lately was the new york rare bird alert page <laughs> and i'm not like i am kind of not really into birds whatsoever they kind of scare me um, so the fact that I was like, I ended up up there was, it's also for an upcoming project that I'm working on. Um, but it was an interesting page to like, look at, to see that, oh, you can go on and see where people are posting like, Hey, I saw this rare bird and <laughs> it's verified. So other people have seen it. And so it was interesting to like, talking about technology, it's like, wow, this is this kind of information's at our disposal. Like, how can I work this into a little mystery so that was my that was my random place that i went it's like what are you looking at birds for <laughs> yeah and I, I tell you what lita um we've got a couple of folks mark and then another individual and i i'm i don't want to mispronounce their their uh their uh, uh log on name but a couple of different people who are like all in on the combat croquet Okay. And, you know, I think we're, we're going to see a pro combat croquet league here before long, and, and we will have you to thank. But uh, um, since, unfortunately, our time is running short, um, this has been lovely. Um, kind of want to shift gears a little bit into kind of our little wrap up things. Uh, what have you been reading? What have you been seeing? What do you recommend? So, Lita, let's start with you. What uh, what books? You got any books you want to you know give a shout out to? You know, I haven't had time to read in a while, but I'm hoping to do so more in the near future. So the first one I'm going to tackle is Staging Wars by Grace Topping. Yay, this is the love third Grace. series. Okay. I read the first first two are great. I just started this one and I can't wait to continue it. So this is my next read. I'm excited. And then I picked up a non-mystery called The Unhoneymooners. I haven't read it, but it sounded intriguing. So I haven't read a non-mystery in a long time as far mm -hmm. as fiction. So I'm looking forward to this one as well. Fabulous. How about you, Sarah? I am um, reading, it's actually an advanced copy of uh, Ballistics at the Ballet by B.J. Bowman. Um, and I just, I read her first novel, which is Music is Murder. And uh, it's about a, a flautist that she's in a symphony and stumbles across a dead body. And it was so good and like, it was so fresh. 
um, of, of, of how the murder unfolded and in what Emily Wilson, the protagonist's involvement was. So I'm really excited to dive into book two, which I believe comes out in June this year. Um, nice. So the yes. Nice. What about you, JC? So um, I took uh, a little bit of a break from uh, mystery. I find myself usually about every three or four months, you know, it's like, okay, I've read a bunch of mysteries, love it all, but it's time for something a little different. So I was rearranging my bookshelves back here and came across a kit, a book that both my kids had read that I never had, Benicula, which is a, it's a, <laughs> it's a kid's book. The story is a family adopts a rabbit um, that the cat believes is a vampire rabbit. And so hilarity ensues. It is just a lovely, you know, like fourth grade level. It was cute and it was fun. Uh, it's called Benicula. And it's the first in a series of a number of books. Came out like 1979. So I missed it when I was growing up. But uh, it was a lot of fun. So um, I'm reading that. And then what I also, or I just finished that. So that was a lot of fun. What I'm currently reading is uh, uh, the latest uh, Last Ditch Mysteries uh, installment. Uh, Scott, oh gee whiz, I can't believe I just blanked on the name. It's it's the latest Lexi Campbell book by Katrina McPherson. Um, and it is, it's book four in the series. It's uh, Scott, oh jazz, it's terrible. Anyway, look it up, it's hysterical. It's kind of along that line of uh, bizarre, fun characters um, that's got an interesting, fun little mystery with it also. So, Lita, okay, so books, how about TV, movies, anything else you want to, anything you want to mention on that end? If I watch TV or movies, I don't watch them too often, but it has to be something with a happy ending, number one, and something <laughs> very light, because I usually watch just before I go to sleep, and so I don't want anything that requires too much thought. So I've enjoyed, as far as mysteries, The Gourmet Detective, I think it's called Mysteries, oh, okay. uh, where there is a uh, famous culinary chef who teams up with a police detective, a homicide detective in San Francisco, and together, everywhere they go, they're both single, by the way, so there's a little hint of romance, too, but everywhere mm -hmm. they go, you know, someone drops dead, so they have to look into it together. Um, and I've also been watching the Aurora Tea Garden series based on okay. the Charlene Harris books. Those are fun and light as well. Okay, so the first one, where where do you uh, where do you want what uh, service I, do you watch that on? I saw it on. I think it was the Hallmark. Uh, okay. Channel. Okay. Okay. Sarah, I'm usually a huge fan of happy endings too, Lita. I'm like, I need things to be happy, but I also have this like really weird like love of scary movies and horror yeah. movies. And uh, one we watched recently, I think it was HBO Max. It was The Night House. Um, it was amazing. It, it was, it's been a long time since I've seen a really good, scary movie. And this one was really, really good. So hmm. I'm probably very much in the minority when it comes to people that love <laughs> scary movies. But it was, I highly recommend it for any of our viewers who are, who are into horror or scariness. Awesome. And it just came to me, Scott Mist is the name of the, the newest Katrina McPherson book that I'm reading. Um, so I'm going to make a shout out to, um, I, of course, I like my happy endings too, believe me, the older I've gotten, even though I love my horror every October. So I'll keep in mind that recommendation, Sarah, come October. Um, but so my recommendation is uh, a new series on Acorn called Signora Volpe. And it is an MI, uh, a woman who uh, worked as a foreign agent uh, for MI6, gets upset when, I don't want to give away too much, something happens, a decision made by the fire ups, higher ups. So she goes off to spend the weekend in Italy with her sister for her niece's wedding. Imagine that. Murder ensues. And then she investigates it using her MI6 background to help solve the case. It's brand new. There are only two episodes out so far. But it's one of those um, that I really love because it's as much of a mystery as it is a travel log. You know, it's just the scenery in Italy is just to die for. That sounds so good. Sounds yeah. really good. That sounds yeah. really good. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So we have come to the end of the bookish hour, and um, we need to make sure that we get our giveaway winner their prize. I'm going to do last call really quickly. The word is casino if you'd like to enter in for a copy of Lita's newest book. 
Um, and once I select, I'm going to have YouTube run its magic in the background to see who our winner is. Um, Lita, thank you so much for being here. You've been an absolute delight. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for hosting me so much. It's, it was a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. Our pleasure all the way. All right, everybody. Drum roll for our winner. I don't know if you can hear that or not. I'm doing drum roll we can, on my we can. Awesome. <laughs> all right. The winner of Lita's giveaway is Leah D. Congratulations. Right, Leah. Leah. Thank Woo! you very much for being here with us. I'm going to put the email address. If you could email whether you'd like an ebook copy or a print copy of Lita's book in just send me an email at giveaways at the because we're super fancy with our official emails <laughs> thanks to sarah yes and and i also before things get away uh lita thank you again so much like sarah said and also i want to make sure that folks for this uh broadcast and this whole effort that sarah and i are doing Sarah's doing like 95% of it. I'm just along as for comic relief. So, um, you know, uh, I will say, though, if um, any of our viewers um, are a writer, blogger, you know, uh, reviewer, if you're into books, um, hit us up. And if you'd like to be on the show, we would love to, to chat with you, especially I know Mark. Um, as a as a book blogger and a book reviewer, we would love to have somebody like that. And and uh, Rose Kerr, who has also been visiting, she's going to be coming up here in a few weeks. So we'll look forward to chatting with her. So, you know, again, thank you all for hanging out with us. Yes. Thank and, you, everyone. Thank you very much. And if you are interested in joining us, feel free to check out our website at www.thebookishhour.com. We have our calendar of availability open. Lita, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and to share so many amazing things about your series. I can't wait to dive in more. It sounds absolutely great. And um, we hope that you'll come back and, and talk to us once, uh, once book six is out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And we will see you in two weeks. So have a good rest of your night, everybody. Thank you. Bye.